So um, yeah, let's get started. So um, that's quite of a provocative um, title, right? Who's responsible for the mess and you know, what we're doing to you know, get to an even keel again, right? So uh, let me first acknowledge quite a few people and obviously you know work like this is never done alone and never in a vacuum and so the, we used to have or still have you know quite an interesting and powerful group at HZDR. Uh, Dominic Krauss for instance, uh, yeah, young Helmholtz, young investigator, has now joined uh, the University of Rostock. Uh, the group of Ona Rekma obviously also does a similar uh, theoretical work uh, as we do and then I used to stay with the Gallagher at the University of Cork for a while. Dave Chapman is now in the private industry with First Light Fusion, for instance, mm -hmm. trying to you know, make uh, fusion energy uh, commercially viable. And then I'm going to talk a lot about uh, what's going on at LCLS or Slack, where the group of uh, Siegfried Glenzer does a lot of pioneering work you know, with X-ray for electron lasers and stuff. I'm going to cover this in detail. And then obviously, Luca Gregori, one of the pioneers of X-ray Thompson scattering, University of Oxford. And Manfred Schlangers, Wolf Kraft, his advisors, and many more, obviously. So uh, let's get started in 1935. Right? Wigner uh, and Huntington said something about the possibility of turning hydrogen, which is usually some kind of insulator, and the gas uh, into a metallic uh, form of it. And so he was also, or they were also talking about uh, solid metallic hydrogen. And um, somewhere, you know, six pages or seven pages, somewhere on page, I don't know, five, it says, you know, very simple estimation uh, of some compressibility and uh, 25,000 yeah, uh, 25, uh, atmospheres, which is uh, 2,500, uh, sorry, 250 uh, kilobar or 25 gigapascal uh, at room temperature, a molecular hydrogen solid turns uh, metallic, which um, obviously seems um, Quite outrageous and uh, maybe even exciting. And so, you know, just predicting this um, turned on a kind of a frenzy. And uh, so there's a timeline down here. Uh, it took a while uh, for people to get started. Uh, first, they needed to invent something that's called a diamond anvil cell. This is how it looks in uh, real life. There's a bit of a ruler down here, which says, I think, four and five centimeters here. So the whole thing is pretty much tabletop. Right? And um, the schematic view of this thing is here uh, on the left. Uh, so you just take two diamonds, point them at each other, and you have a gasket here. And uh, in between, you put whatever you want to squeeze. Uh, in addition, with a ruby, which is your pressure standard. And then you put the whole thing you know, in this kind of framework here with some screws. And then you have a regular screwdriver Oh, you know, the one, the same you get uh, with IKEA to um, install your furniture and just tighten the screws and then pressure is something like force over, uh, force over area. And then, you know, with this, these tips here, maybe have a diameter of 100 microns or even 10 microns nowadays. Um, you know, you don't need all that much force to squeeze what's in here to a mega bar, like 100 gigapascal, 200 gigapascal, whatever. Right? And uh, diamonds are quite nice, so you can shine light through them and then see what's happening to, say, the hydrogen that you have filled in here. And so then, in 1990, Mao and co-workers, I think back then even at the Geophysical Laboratory in Washington, where I did my poster, reported that, yes, finally, not at 25 gigapascal, but at slightly higher 150 gigapascal, we found the metallization. And then something uh, very familiar kicks in and there's a different player in the same game who then raises an objection and basically says, nope, your claim that obviously uh, is, high prof is a high profile publication, your claim is not valid and what you say is wrong. And so, you know, then it goes on and this Mao and Hamlet, these are basically the same working groups, yeah. Uh, 1996 say, no, we haven't found anything to 216 and, and the Japanese group, yeah, by this time, every country had one or two labs that uh, were employing diamond endo cells. So even 342 gigapascal did nothing. And uh, then the French guys, Loubert, yeah, one of the popes in this high pressure, warm and matter regime said, no, we haven't even found it here. And obviously they did something wrong and so on and so forth, right? And this goes on and on, there's always something Somebody finds something, somebody else contradicts it, and they did the wrong measurements, they didn't do enough measurements. 
And then the big thing in 2017, that's I think a science here or something. Yeah, we finally found it at 495 gigapascal. And then everybody, Gonsharov is basically the same group as Hamley and Mao earlier. Um, they obviously found something to pick. Uh, the big thing here in this Diaz and Silvera paper is that actually it was really only Diaz and Silvera. Everybody else here is a working group of 10 to 15. Uh, they did it all by themselves and uh, the decisive picture was taken with an iPhone mm -hmm. right through the diamonds and so, you know, a bit fishy. Anyway, so this quest for solid metallic hydrogen and here on the right, if you wanted to see uh, as you know, temperature pressure diagram of like what they think they have found and what they haven't found, um, this uh, whole thing is wide open to now, right? We are 85 years later from now, or even further, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and uh, no solid metallic hydrogen has been found. Um, no, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, but surely, if you increase the temperature a bit, uh, we may find a metallic hydrogen in a fluid which also would be quite nice. So that's a temperature here, that's a pressure here. Um, there's a melt line down here. Oh, that's a theoretical prediction. And yes, everybody is quite sure that uh, fluid metallic hydrogen exists, except that people can't seem to agree on where it should be, right? So there's a theoretical prediction here, right? So over here on the left, there's always a molecular fluid. On the right of any kind of these curves here is supposed to be a metallic fluid. So there's a prediction here of where this changes. And there's a different prediction here, another prediction here, and then one here, and then one over here. And also these are experimental points here. And this is another experimental campaign, right? So we have gas scan data, uh, 1996, I think these are two, two, those here, and what's called a Z machine data, somewhere over here, right? So everybody is quite happy uh, to admit that uh, they are sure that we have fluid metallic hydrogen, but nobody seemed to agree where this is actually the case, you know, what is the transition region, is this a phase transition, is it a continuous transition, whatever, right? So again, all of them feel familiar with what DFT or DFTMD means or even QMC, right? All of these are first principle simulations, right? Who take absolutely no approximation whatsoever, right? And uh, obviously they do. And so then what you get is, uh, you know, a variety of curves, uh, with a factor of four in between, and nothing seems very what sure. What do they measure? They measure conductivity? Yes, uh, conductivity, reflectivity, the like. Okay. Right. Sometimes it's as easy as sticking two electrodes in and seeing what the voltage is. This is basically what uh, these guys here in 1996, mm -hmm. this way, what they did. Right. It's a bit more complicated uh, with the Z machine, right? but uh, where they usually do some optical diagnostics, uh, optical and you know, electromagnetic stuff. Um, uh, yes, okay, there was a question. So, so I guess that goes with the previous question. As a non-physicist, what is the difference between a molecular fluid and a metallic fluid? Okay, the molecular fluid you can look through. Okay. It will be insulating, so you will, will not, it's a, you know, just plastic, right? It will, will not conduct the electricity. Mm -hmm. and, and the metallic hydrogen is just similar to aluminium or mm -hmm. iron or whatever. Like or copper. electronics inside the control. Absolutely. Like mercury, okay. Right? So okay. Molecular, right? In, in the molecular part, mm -hmm. there's even molecules. It's not just atoms, but there's hydrogen molecules in it, mm -hmm. right? In the metallic, uh, either solid or fluid uh, metallic hydrogen, you will have protons and electrons, and both are free. In a way, in a solid, obviously the protons will form some kind of lattice, okay. like a body uh, center cubic lattice is usually expected. At higher pressures, and whatever, might that even be FCC. Right? Uh, but in the fluid metallic hydrogen, it's uh, protons that are free to diffuse wherever they like with a bit of short range order, mm -hmm. and the electrons are usually degenerate, like electronic fluid. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, right, uh, and this Knudsen data is the latest uh, we have on the um, fluid metallic hydrogen science 2015 and uh, lots of work being put into since then but no conclusive evidence either way yet. The latest uh, is a science paper of some Chinese dudes that I tried to uh, not get published as a referee but they finally managed also it into science or something where they again claim that, that this transition here say you know this black solid line uh, this is supposed to be a first order tra phase transition and these guys uh, claim that it is actually no phase transition at all. So, you know, 
the whole nature of the transition and the location of the transition is um, you know, um, up to speculation, right? Okay, next one, right? So the whole thing, the whole introduction is still, you know, are these guys visionaries, like a Wigner or bad scientists, right? And the next one is Marvin Ross, uh, Nature in 1981. There's planets, right, like Uranus and Neptune, which are the, these are usually called ice planets because they have a um, bit of uh, yeah, hydrogen or like obviously uh, water, methane and ammoniac and other hydrogen helium uh, uh, contents in them. And then one could uh, speculate under certain conditions that the carbon in all of these compounds might actually uh, demix uh, from the rest and then maybe fall out as diamonds, right? And, uh, for the whole thing, by right, sky is a bit um, preposterous, right? So it's a fluid plan or you know, a giant gas plan or something. You will not have a sky on the surface, right? It's just like one big uh, pressure increase from the outer layers to the inner layers and uh, might or might not be a phase transition from a gas to a fluid uh, at some point, right? But, um, you know, he says diamonds will form and uh, they will then, of course, because of a higher density, you know, like drop into the, in the direction of the center. And um, the whole thing is that um, that's this, this phase diagram of, this is just a phase diagram of carbon here and that he used uh, to make his prediction. And it's uh, definitely not right and not correct. And uh, this is the isentrope of the, or like the location of the Uranus ice layer, which based on the interior models of the planets at this time, is most certainly wrong. Right, so um, okay, you know, he leaned out the window, and then but the thing is that in 2017, uh, Dominic using the LCLS, um, created this headline and uh, he actually found it right, uh, as far as we believe. So it only cost some billion dollars, um, because somebody had to you know design and build a tunnel at uh, Stanford and then install a an, uh, linear electron accelerator and then. Once this was built, uh, put an undulator at the back of it to actually create an X-ray free electron laser. Uh, but once you have this tiny little tool, uh, the X-ray free electron laser is about a kilometer long or something. Right? Once you have this tool and the appropriate uh, pump laser, and um, you have like a pretty nice uh, standard setup of uh, contemporary like high pressure or warm lens matter physics, where you just you know have your target here. And uh, this is basically just a plastic foil, uh, run of the mill plastic, uh, carbon 50%, hydrogen the other 50% in numbers, bit of aluminum uh, coating on both sides, just uh, uh, to for the laser, for the pump laser to couple in. So that's a tabletop, nowadays a tabletop um, pump laser here, optical, uh, 10 nanoseconds in a two step process. So to actually uh, shock it like twice. And at the appropriate times, the uh, X-ray free electron laser shoots through the point here in the target that you've used. And then uh, this here are real data. And then here on the right hand side, uh, time resolve, right? The first one here is at six nanoseconds and then all the way down to 40 nanoseconds. You get the X-ray diffraction data, you know, within this uh, you know, very much shocked system. And so, you know, it's obviously very hot and very fluid. So this is the underlying structure here, you know, of something, um, you know, you're getting a, 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 some kind of signal everywhere. But out of the signal, you see here, this peak growing. And also, you know, with a bit of goodwill, you will see a second one here. And uh, these peaks are break peaks, as you would do, you know, when you run any kind of copper or any kind of other, you know, crystal uh, through an X-ray diagnostics, you get break peaks. And in this sense here, you get break peaks uh, of an di of a diamond lattice at not the standard density. This is the, the gray dashed line here. It's the standard density of diamond, but at a slightly increased density of 4.1 grams per cubic centimeter. And uh, you see this uh, growing here. So basically, what's happening here? There's a plastic foil with carbon and hydrogen in it. And carbon and hydrogen have phase separated, and the temperature in here, as it will turn out, is below the diamond melting temperature. And so, once carbon and hydrogen have uh, phase separated, maybe um, the diamond just or the carbons just stick together and freeze out as nano diamonds. And so, this is, as we believe, or as it, you know, 
uh, the same situation as might happen on, on Neptune and Uranus. So that's why, you know, diamonds in the sky, and but these are obviously nano diamonds. So, right, so there's one prediction where we still very much struggle, and then uh, one other prediction where we think we might have found it, even though the actual, like, you know, physics of how this demixes or how fast the um, diamonds grow, or, you know, uh, in what region, because this is just one data point, right? This is for one pressure and one temperature, right? We haven't done any, like, pressure, pressure or temperature scan for this, not, not in, in a very uh, broad sense. So this is, um, you know, the success of some, uh, you know, campaign or the successful end, you know, temporary end to, to a certain prediction, right? And so, you know, in between those two extremes, um, I'm going to talk a bit about, you know, already mentioned, right, we shocked the system. So, you know, how you would usually do shock experiments. And then we need to talk a little bit about, um, you know, this X-ray diagnostics of the whole thing and what the advantages of, you know, why do we take an X-ray free electron laser? Can we get the X-rays from, from some other place? And then some, maybe some recent um, success of combining, you know, shock physics with uh, the possibilities of an X-ray free electron laser. And then after I've told you how nice everything is, then um, want to tell you that maybe that's not the case and we have to think about lots of stuff and what's um, maybe <laughs> very interesting is that obviously all these experiments they are over on a nanosecond time scale or even faster so all these experiments are destructive you know afterwards the foil or you know the target uh, won't be there anymore right but then we want to um, go from stuff that happens on nanoseconds to processes that in, uh, on a planetary scale happens over you know hundred million years or you know even a billion years. Sort of thing. And uh, in case you're missing, so you can almost everywhere insert the theoretical method of your choice. I mean, usually our work was you know density functional molecular dynamics, but uh, most of the stuff um, works um, with other theories as well. And this is one of the problems. Of the whole thing. Okay, um, you know controver controversies. Uh, traditional shock experiments. Uh, usually you rely on the fact that you know you have some system and you compress it uh, can do it okay any russian scene okay, the russian way would be to just take a tnt or c4 mm -hmm. and uh, explode it in a glass chamber and then uh, you can have a gas gun which just means that you have a projector so let's say an aluminium pusher and you you know almost like an air gun right you accelerate it and smash it into your target or, you know, the most advanced and modern, you know, cleanest ways, say, you know, you take a, just a laser and, you know, the rocket effect, you know, laser into a surface, surface blows off and rocket effect, you know, then compresses the, the rest of the target. And then uh, the fanciest pictures are the Z machine. If we have time in the end, I'll show you a picture of the Z machine. Uh, that's really nice as well. Anyway, so you push matter uh, with a velocity that's higher than the sound speed. So no information on uh, that the pusher is coming is available here on the right hand side. And uh, if this you know push here is planar enough and lots of other um, and not too fast and blah blah blah, then uh, mass, momentum, and energy conservation tells you that there's a connection between the internal energy before and after, and the pressure before and after the shock, and the densities before and after the shock. Okay, so this is basically, if this is uh, all uh, very valid, this is, uh, and if you have an equation of state, then, you know, this is, or you can learn about the equation of state from this, right? Internal energy, pressure, density, temperature is implicit. And this looks then here in this uh, diagram like this, uh, pressure on the y-axis, density over normalized to the initial density on the x-axis. And I'm going to show you two different, um, Theoretical uh, predictions here, that's a sesame, that's a very well-known and very often used uh, equation of state table database um, that's mostly based on, on experiments, but also has some theoretical capability or some theoretical um, calculations uh, in it. So this is uh, basically just you know, a table and uh, there's different versions of it, but this is standard. And then DFTMD uh, can either be my calculations or calculations of somebody else. Uh, in this sense, uh, most DFTMD calculations predict this one here, slightly more compressible over here at the 50 gigapascal range, and then basically the same over here. And we know that for high uh, pressures and temperatures, 
uh, this ratio of rho to rho zero has to be about four. Right? So all of this needs to go to four, but you know, maybe not at 250, but at 500 or 1000 gigapascals. And along this line, uh, the temperature is rising uh, smoothly. Also, which um, material is this? Sorry. Oh, that's hydrogen. Just hydrogen. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, and then the other thing is that, yes, if you do one shock, you will get one of these points, right? So a higher shock with a higher shock speed here, yeah, where your pusher flies into the target faster, you get this. If it's relatively slower, you will get this point. So one, two, three, four, whatever, 10 experiments you can see here, right? With the, what's called the Nova laser. So basically, you know, just a laser used to blow up the surface of a target and then drive a shock wave into it. And, uh, Right, so these are the experiments, and so obviously this is a challenge to uh, theory because the compressibility here in these experiments is a lot higher. So maybe we don't understand what's going on here. Maybe all these theoretical predictions are wrong. Maybe our first principle simulation of DFTMD, uh, you know, is not uh, good enough. And um, so the next thing is that obviously you can do the experiments again. Uh, this time, you know, the uh, flyer, that's really a flyer plate with a Z machine, magnetically accelerated, whatever, tiny little aluminum plate, smashing into hydrogen. And uh, lo and behold, uh, almost, uh, obviously we get big error bus here, but um, they agree quite nicely with the theoretical uh, predictions. And um, so, you know, that's data from the Nova laser in 1998, and then Knudsen in 2004 has something different to say. And uh, so one of the issues here is um, that uh, there's one, uh, you can't, from this experiment, you can't just extract all the necessary data here. You need something that, uh, for the, it's called impedance matching, you need a pressure standard. And depending on what pressure standard you need or how accurate your pressure standard is, you might or might not get the right pressures or the right densities. And uh, just to make sure, uh, okay, that's what I just said here, right? Uh, and usually the pressure standard is uh, aluminum or quartz. And now you might wonder if we're, into, if we're uh, experimentally trying to determine the equation of state here with a shock experiment, and where do we get the equation of state for aluminum or quartz from? And the answer is, of course, from similar shock experiments. And then the question would, of course, be, do we need a pressure standard for these as well? And the answer would be yes. So it's kind of a circular argument. And uh, so you can always try to calculate these, but um, I'll show you, okay, the issue of these I'll show you in a minute. Anyway, there's uh, going to be a th third set of um, experiments. Omega is a different laser than Nova, you know, again in America. But uh, the issue is here, yeah, the green points, so they are right, uh, almost in agreement here. But then, you know, for the more interesting points here, these green curves uh, right smack bang in the middle between the red and the gray ones. And so the confusion is perfect. And uh, to make it even worse, is in uh, 2009, Mr. Knudsen redefined in his PRL the uh, pressure standard quartz, which means, so he said the equation of state of quartz before it was wrong, now it's correct, and then he reanalyzed the uh, green curve, uh, the green data points, and got the blue ones, which are now in the middle part here, more in line with the black sesame and the orange uh, DFTMD results. But now these points are off here at the, uh, in the pressure range between 100 and 50 gigapascal. Right? So hydrogen, yeah, simple element, but also very complicated. And I could make, you know, maybe show you some more experiments. And then the cloud of points here would be a lot worse. And uh, so it, it, right now with the more modern um, values, uh, it looks like as if they should be somewhere over here. Uh, you know. And also, uh, again, temperature is implicit. And just because you know there's a same curve here for two different data sets, it doesn't mean that they really agree because they might show different temperatures along uh, this curve. Okay, and so that's basically the summary here. You need not only to these pressure or shock measurements here, you need only to also to determine the temperature independently. And what people have done in the past, it's called pyrometry. So that's an optical emission from the, from the shock front. And this is as a temperature measurement, you need to assume it's a black body, it's a gray body, whatever. You have only a very tiny range of, uh, in terms of frequency or wavelength that comes out of the shock front, right? The rest of the plasma is absorbing. And so, Right? Pressure and temperature at a density need to match, 
and the temperature measurement are very doubtful. Okay, and so that's uh, basically like a red uh, line that goes through the whole talk, right? Temperature. Where do we get temperature from, or is there temperature at all? Right. So that's basically uh, at least for hydrogen here uh, for these shock experiments. You know, for this pressure range and state of the art. And so, how uh, would we like to solve this? And um, this is by looking not just at the pressure or at the shock front, or looking at it from the outside, but uh, looking at the uh, created system from the inside. And so, really getting into the detail, getting the structure right. Right. Uh, this means uh, you know, if an ion or an electron is somewhere, where are the other electrons? You know, what's their spatial distribution? Um, how do they change over time? Right, and this can be done um, by irradiating the target with uh, some electromagnetic irradiation that is in frequency high enough. And for the high densities, we need to um, overcome the barrier of the plasma frequency. So we would like or we need to do uh, to use X-rays for this. And so this is basically what's happening for it when you have an incident photon. You know, it can be an X-ray photon gets a kick and then the outgoing uh, photon is scattered a bit, single electron in a many particle system. You know, there's atoms, there's three electrons, there's lots of stuff going on. You can have three electrons being kicked, uh, you know, Compton effects, you can have bound free transitions, you can have elastic scattering. And all of this physics you know, tells us if we would collect the spectrum a lot about what's going on and uh, you know, we can gain lots of information from it. And so it turns out that obviously the scattered intensity is very much proportional to the total electron electron structure factor. And then, you know, there's a free electron part, and you know, it's an inelastic scattering that's in this schematic spectrum here, the red curve. And then we have an ion feature, that's a green one here, that's uh, all elastic scattering. This is basically uh, those uh, lower rings or Bragg peaks that you see in X ray crystallography, you know, for metals, from organic uh, solids, uh, even, you know, if you want to analyze a virus, by, you know accidentally or a biomolecule, right? This is what people go for, for this ion feature. And usually you just get a form factor, so that's the electron distribution around the ion. And then uh, since we have three electrons, you get a screening cloud as well. And then any kind of, you know, X-ray ionization is in this bound free feature here. Right, or even excitation if you like. So anything, uh, you know, where you kick an electron out of a state, out of a bound state is here. And then this is here in the spectrum somewhere, you know, contribution below or even above the electron feature. Depending on your incoming energy, right, you will get a spectrum that looks something like this. And the idea would be to measure some of the spectrum and also have uh, theories that are you know, very nice and very accurate for the red, the green, and the blue part here, and then match them and then gain some information. Right? Okay, and how well this uh, will work. I'll show you in the next. So first we still have to think about where do we get the X-rays from. So we need quite some high intensity. And um, so there's two possibilities. Uh, the, I mean, it's not that old, but the older, the old fashioned possibility is here on the left. Uh, those four drives here on the back. Uh, there's actually four, there's two, two co green cones here in the front. Um, they are for compressing. These are drive beams and then four in the back. Uh, irradiate uh, this shield and then you know this uh, contraption here from the back they produce um, the uh, x-rays right so and the spectrum you get out of this is shown here in the left uh, picture and it's a bit of noisy and the width here is just the width of the line of the x-rays that you produce here with those four optical uh, backlight ideas so that's uh, good enough and this is an experiment here on lithium and you know this shoulder here is the actual uh, you know inelastic uh, signal, and then the blue line here, uh, this is the fit of this part of the spectrum. Okay, you know that's a 2.9 keV, and you know we have a certain width here. And the cleaner and more modern and more expensive and all around a lot better method is, as I said, uh, using a uh, X-ray free electron laser beam. And that's an uh, example here uh, of how the spectrum looks like. A single shot, a single shot um, for aluminium on the left here. That's also the single shot, and uh, this system here is capable of maybe one or two shots a day. That's a Vulcan laser and uh, near Oxford in um, 
uh, in England, right? So maybe nowadays they are, I don't know, much shorter now, but uh, this one here, the LCLS, with the setup, uh, this width here is not the laser, the, the X-ray free electron laser actually has a full width half maximum of about 1 EV, so it's very narrow. Uh, Dominic tells me that this width here is just the detector, which at this point, when the experiment was conducted, uh, had like, you know, a full width half maximum of about this 5, 6, or 7 EV. Right? So if the detector were better, then uh, this uh, elastic peak here would be a lot narrower and we could resolve also uh, some structure here. So this is just noise here, but uh, there's some structure in here as well. And also this system here is capable of not just shooting once uh, an hour, but I don't know, maybe, what's it like? Are they already at one hertz? Uh, probably at 0 0.1 hertz or something. So th this laser beam here, the pump laser is uh, very nice by now. And I mean, you know, modern, X, uh, modern uh, XFALs, they can, uh, the one in Hamburg, they go all the way up to 10 hertz or something. Or the one in Hamburg is kilohertz. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's not only that the uh, quality of the X-ray beam is better. The LCLS has 100 hertz. Okay. Right. So not only that the quality is better, but the data collection rate is also a lot better. Okay. So and everything uh, I'm going to be shown from now on. You know, the similar setup here is uh, you know LCLS and or like XFAL here, and then some optical laser beam. But the optical laser has only at best 10 hertz. Yeah. Okay, and so now we wanted to put everything together. So our family uh, setup here, uh, drive laser here, with, you know, compresses the stuff over six nanoseconds, and then some X-ray XFAL beam. And this time we're not shocking just CH, but mylar, which is you know a different type of plastic where there's a bit of oxygen in there as well. And then again, just to uh, to drive the shock wave, uh, it's a very thin layer of aluminium here on the front and uh, the solid visor, so our uh, velocity interferometry that uh, looks at the shock front sees something, a bit of aluminium on the back as well. And um, doing this, again, there is a time-resolved uh, elastic scattering here in the left uh, lower, uh, hand pa uh, lower panel. And so at the beginning here, you see lots of, um, okay, Mylar is also PET. Uh, you see lots of structure here and then you know with increasing in time the whole thing gets compressed and also it gets heated a bit little and so we're just left with you know very if you want boring looking stuff here down here so no peaks anymore but this is a highly correlated uh, liquid of you know carbon uh, hydrogen and oxygen and so this is the blue you know line with those arrow bars here as a you know zoom in of one of those uh, curves here and now we can you know, this X-ray diffraction signal, we can use DFTMD to calculate the ion structure, to calculate the electron and form factor and the electron screening cloud. And we can, you know, build this uh, X-ray diffraction signal just from theory. And obviously this uh, signal here or the theoretical signal changes with temperature and also, you know, with density or, you know, the way you like. And then, you know, just the usual trying to fit one with the other, we get an idea of what the temperature is in there, what the pressure is in there, what the density is in there, right? And uh, so that's, uh, you know, we have a lot more information here than the usual shock experiment. We do have, um, you know, the structure and we can try to fit the experimentally obtained data with our theoretical or synthetic spectrum. And in addition, since this is a normal shock experiment, we have all the data as we had before on pressure and density. So what um, we get here uh, from the experiment here with via visor and stuff is these, uh, this fuzzy point here and here. And uh, in addition, obviously, I can use DFTMD to calculate the hugo -Nio, right? So there's the first principle, uh, theoretically generated hugo -Nio. And this is the, uh, this uh, curve here and then this one and in addition okay so first of all what we see is that uh, the theoretically generated hugo -Nio, yeah, it goes right through the point that we believe the experiment sits on from the experimental analysis uh, and not just in pressure density space but also in temperature pressure or temperature density space so we not only have in traditional shock experiments you might remember i only said something about pressure and i said something about density I never explicitly was able to show any temperature. So now we have 
all three of them. So we have complete information on the high pressure equation of state. And also we have, of course, some information on, on how the structure looks like. And all of this uh, between our experiment and DFTMD is consistent. It's not just the Huguenot is consistent with each other, but also the structure is consistent with each other. What determined the choice of Mylar for PET? Oh yeah, the, the, the idea was that um, uh, try to see more diamond nucleation and um, maybe that the oxygen uh, kind of can further it. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, the hope was um, <laughs> smashed. So we did. <laughs> and uh, in addition, we can uh, compare here to uh, this disk curve here. As well, there's another one, the blue one down here. Uh, these are uh, one is the, the blue one is sesame. Similar uh, equation of state table as before for hydrogen. But obviously, they have uh, tables or data for this mylar as well. And then there's a Propeus uh, equation of state, different model. And we can see that uh, none of them actually captures uh, correctly what um, uh, we have found. So these tables that are used in hydrodynamic simulations and for lots of other predictions, um, say you would use them in, if you wanted to do run some, some fusion calculations and some predictions whether or not your machine can actually achieve inertial fusion or any kind of other fusion and uh, be, um, you know, have gained. And so all of these uh, cases of state tables that are published uh, seem in this pressure region, you know, for this particular area, of parameters seem wrong, right? So combining shocking, uh, shock experiment with XRTS diagnostics or XRD diagnostics seems like a very nice uh, thing to do. And you gain a lot more information, you have a lot more certainty about um, you know, your theory and about your experimental values and you can get temperature. Right? And uh, now that I've shown you like how nice everything is, I'm gonna a question before you go. Sure. I'm just curious in this in the experimental setup, these layers. Yeah. Is it just for structural no reasons or is no, no, it? No, it, it's a freestanding foil. So in the beginning, this is a solid, and uh, the, the foil would be there without it. It's uh, on the left to um, have something to uh, blow blow off and then you know shock the uh, PET or MILA. And on, on the back, if uh, visor sees it, and if it's gone, then you know that the shock wave is, has reached the uh, the other side. And then you know you have a shock timing. Yes. So it's, it's good for timing, for experimental purposes, and makes diagnostics easier. And it's really 100 nanometers very thin. It's, it's not used to heat yeah. in that sense. No. No. I mean, the shock will do so, yeah. right? But uh, no. Okay. okay. I, I mean, what, what you presented is now for Mylar, but uh, I mean, as we all know, uh, NIF is not, uh, has not been very successful in producing fusion, as, as was usually expected. Uh, normally, it's attributed to some turbulence in the, yes. in the, uh, in the target, uh, but if they have used the wrong, uh, uh, the wrong equation of state, uh, yes. that would yes. also yes. be an yes. additional mistake. And, and also, um, sometimes the ablator at NIF yeah. Uh, sort of could be just you know, carbon or carbon hydrogen. Mm -hmm. And if uh, on the path uh, a long compression, at some point uh, carbon and hydrogen decides to demix, mm -hmm. this will also you know, include some graininess and will you know, destroy the whole idea of like, what's supposed to happen. Okay. So, uh, okay, anyway, this uh, looks uh, actually very nice. And now I'm going to destroy the nice hopes and uh, with what's called um, you know, a model dependent measurement. Right? So um, it's quite trivial. Right? Any thermometer? Doesn't actually measure temp temperature, but just you know change the length, right? And also then we know that we have a, a certain coefficient, and you know our uh, mercury changes in length uh, with change temperature by so much, and then blah, we know our temperature, right? And that's obviously now in, in our case, right? So we have an XRTS experiment that uh, measures or you know gets the dynamic structure factor. We have a first principle simulations that uh, can produce the same. And if we uh, put one on top of the other, then we say we extract the density and the temperature, and this is then our measured value, right? And then, of course, from all of this falls an equation of state, some static structure, dialectic function, transport quantities like conductivity, heat conductivity, whatever you like, right? Diffusion. But, um, right, there is no such thing as a true first principle simulation. And a very important uncontrolled approximation in our DFT simulations is the exchange correlation functional. Right? So we change this, uh, we change the density and temperature that we have measured. Right? If we don't use DFT, 
but something else, average atom code or you know other plasma physics inspired models, or we use quantum Monte Carlo. Again, you know, there will be a different dynamic structure factor, therefore there will be a different density and temperature. Right? So we cannot be sure. So what's going on here is always this feedback loop, right? Uh, do we really, can we really um, describe everything uh, that the experiment gives us? Right? Can we get consistent between different quantities? And then, so we constantly have to learn uh, and, and readjust and put a different uh, theoretical method here. Right? When people started out doing this in maybe say 2003 or 2000, we used very simple, if, if you've heard random phase approximation, Lintard, Lintard uh, dialectic function um, to try to model the dynamic structure. And then people introduced local field corrections, then people introduced electron ion collisions, then people starting doing, started doing DFT, then people started doing TDDFT, and now people start doing quantum Monte Carlo, right? So it's, uh, it's basically, you know, one giant, uh, you know, race to the top. And um, so everything I've told you here in terms of what temperature, what pressure, what density we have here is subject to the theoretical method that is used. And even though everybody, you know, believes that DFT is good enough, um, it might well turn out not to be, you know, and def definitely uh, not for all materials, all conditions. And, uh, all right, and now the fun bit, right? Um, out of, I'm just going to go back for a second. Out of those Bragg peaks here, right? Uh, so for an infinite lattice, and which is stable, at t equal to zero, those peaks here would be very, very high, very, very narrow. Now, this is at a temperature which lowers these peaks here. Also, uh, what we're looking at here is nano diamonds. So there are like some nanometers, 10, 4, 5, 50 nanometers. So there are finite systems that makes, gives these peaks here a, a finite width, right? This you can analyze. If you do so, uh, you learn something about the size for nanometers of those nano diamonds. And we know the time scale of the experiment is about 500 picoseconds, right? So the, the overall, overall experiment is a bit bigger, but the shockwave travels through it. So that's an estimate. So now we're going to be very bold and conclude from 500 picoseconds uh, constant uh, growth rates and say that in 100 million years, so typical, you know, time scale in a planet, we will have diamonds a diameter of 70 centimeters hmm. okay i mean it sounds good right but i mean it's uh, leaning out the window a bit and the uh, next uh, interesting observation is here it's temperature here over carbon concentration and uh during Gelli and co-workers have for these uh, all the way up to here to a carbon concentration of 0.35 or something calculated uh, nucleation theory um you know how quickly um in a CH um, system, carbons or uh, nano diamonds should, uh, you know, nucleate. You know, should start existing. And so there's no nano diamonds here, according to them. And they say that there should be some diamond nucleation on the order of 10 to the minus 40 per cubic meter and per second. And somewhere up here, there's even smaller the rate, right? So very, very negligible nucleation. Our uh, nucleation is somewhere over here, right? Carbon concentration 0.5. And uh, this is the one we've been talking about at rates of 10 to the 29 to 10 to the 30 to 34. And uh, at the lower value of 70 GPA, right? Second experiment, uh, there's no diamond formation observed, so zero. Okay, so these two contradict these two completely. Right? So there's this diamond nucleation down here and no one up here, so this is the other way around. And also, yeah, 10 to the minus 40 to 10 to the whatever 30. That's uh, quite a disagreement. And a uh, big question, obviously, right? Obviously, there's a theory here, there's a bit of an experiment, there's a massive uh, estimation, right? but uh, it's a nice um, difference. Right? Okay, so, right, big question mark here. Next one, uh, okay, this diamond again, so now we switch to iron. And this is S uh, at Earth core conditions. And um, the thing is that, okay, what you see here is really, again, the X-ray diffraction. And you see, you know, rings here. And the line out is something like this. That's a fluid structure. 
And when you look at case B here, you know, there's not, not just rings here where you see some spots if you like. And um, maybe you have to believe me when I say that um, these spots uh, hint uh, for an HCP lattice of iron. Temperature, you know, analyzed the same way using DFTMD as before, hints to that at these conditions, uh, earth core like 350, 400 GPA, you should have a liquid, uh, should have liquid iron. These spots here actually mean, or even these spots mean, nope, there is uh, still a solid in there. And the next, so this is basically usually one in shock experiments one likes to uh, investigate equilibrium. If there are at these temperatures, the temperatures are true, and obviously the experimental results show spots. This means that we have a superheated state of iron. So this means that in our shock experiment, even though everybody likes to investigate the equation of state and equilibrium and defines the temperature and whatnot, uh, what we have here is not an equilibrium state over nanoseconds, right? Every, so every single theory that uh, you know deals with how quickly it equilibrates a system at these kind of pressures will tell you that after nanoseconds in a shock experiment, you have always an equilibrium state, right? So you can investigate in this way an equilibrium state as it would be in a planet. This says, no, oh, you can't, right? Might just be a case with iron because iron is special, might be general, right? So anyway, you definitely have to be careful. But uh, we only found this because- What do you mean by equilibrium? The iron and electron temperatures yes. are the same? Or yes. can define what temperature and the density and, and they uh, are connected by, a, by an equation of state, okay? But before and all those uh, um, shock experiments without X-ray diffraction, without X-ray Thomson scattering, there was no information on actually the state in the system. Right, so we were only were able to get this data using an XFL. Right, so now, you know, after, I don't know, 50 years of shock experiments, we find that maybe, you know, we have to be a lot more careful about, you know, what kind of experiments and what drive, you know, what kind of intensity we can actually do in order to gain meaningful information. And so this is only possible using but there XFLs. There are theories that can tell you how fast you come to equilibrium. Yes. Have they been applied to these types of uh, We tried, but uh, you know, every theory says it shouldn't take this long. Okay, okay. Right, and uh, okay, yeah, one problem, well, I don't know, 40 or 80 orders of magnitude, then uh, trying to be in equilibrium when you're not, even worse. Um, if you look at it closely enough, and people already did in 92 and 95, in silicon this time, um, when you drive a shockwave through a system, uh, you kick the ions a lot and um, the electrons can't follow quickly enough. So actually in a shock, a born oppenheimer approximation that the electrons are always instantaneously uh, in equilibrium and in the optimal state that your ions take uh, is violated. And so at least the least bit what you get is a certain amount of time before um, the ions and electrons you know, are in equilibrium again. And this is means there's an ion temperature here and an electron temperature. So this is the contrary case to what's usually happening in laser experiments. In laser experiments, uh, you know, when you heat the electrons directly, the electrons are hot and the ions are cold. In shock experiment, it's the other way around. And so these guys estimated that it takes uh, 200, 250 picoseconds. So if you were to wait a nanosecond, you should be fine, right? If for whatever reason, you need to run your, your measurement, you know, a short way after, then um, you're in trouble, right? So then you're not measuring in this sense uh, uh, equilibrium. Okay, and this is, uh, I don't know, some people call this zero D. There is no hydrodynamic turbulence or all these other hydrodynamic uh, non-equilibrium, you know, anisotropies, inhomogeneities in there, right? So this is just, uh, you know, zero D physics. And, um, Right, so that's uh, the next problem that one has to be aware of, you know, trying to run these shock experiments, try to measure stuff, right? So, uh, and then of course, related to this, I mean, X-ray laser has by definition a very high intensity and X-rays have a high photon energy. So, I mean, how likely is it that they only just kick the electrons or the system a bit and not like disturb it totally? Right? And so, 
obviously, you know, just okay, even if one wanted to uh, investigate some equilibrium property of some far off exotic um, uh, planet, and then for this, you need to create an exotic state of matter, you still need to think about uh, non equilibrium that one might um, create and uh, how to, you know, avoid it in the measurement process. Right? And uh, I guess that's basically it, uh, all that I wanted to say, right? Uh, outlook is always faster, higher, stronger, right? So for a mentioned if, right, we want to go to higher densities, we want to go not to compression of one and a half, two, we want to go to compression of 50 and see not what's in planets, but planets, but what's, uh, you know, it's happening in brown dwarfs. Um, we want to, you know, irradiate the sample with higher intensities. And uh, Tobias has something to say about, right? So there's a point up here, uh, 10 to the 35 um, peak brightness, uh, some ridiculous number anyway. So this is a very high fluence of, up here of um, an X-ray free electron laser way higher than any other uh, light sources. And you know, what this does to matter is obviously um, interesting. So you can analyze matter very nicely and you can disturb matter very nicely and you can create uh, very high a very new uh, states of matter. And then with those uh, LCLS or uh, European XFL uh, devices, you know, you can go shorter, right? So this is the, supposed to be the pump pulse here. And then you can, uh, with a certain time delay, with a variable time delay, very quickly in time, um, analyze what's going on and, you know, maybe even see relaxation processes that we like to calculate. And then obviously everything that we want to do um, from a theoretical point of view, we want to do more accurate, more reliable. We not only want to like fit stuff, you know, the, the buzzword is predictive capabilities. And, um, you know, everybody likes to say that we already are there and can do so, but in reality, um, it's not really the case. You know, as I already mentioned, DFT takes the uncontrolled approximation of the exchange correlation functional. TDDFT that we use a lot now uh, takes additional uncontrolled uh, approximation of the exchange correlation kernel, right? Um, most of the time we use lots of approximations in terms of what does temperature, should we include temperature and so on. And um, so there's lots to be done um, to you know, get uh, the theory to a point where we can actually, you know, produce a result and then tell experimentalists that's the result. And if you don't get it, then your experiment is wrong. Right, so right now it's uh, sometimes we are right, or sometimes they are right, and sometimes nobody, most of the time nobody's right. <laughs> okay, so that's it. Uh, yes. Questions? Oh, uh, or like, uh, basic question how, what kind of theories do you use to calculate relaxation times? To... Uh, yes, okay. Uh, any kind of quantum simulation, like uh, what, what Tobias is using, uh, won't work because Monte Carlo is just equilibrium, right? One could use uh, MD simulations, um, but uh, they won't work for warm dense matter states because the ion ion potential is not known. That's what DFT MD is for, so get the uh, forces in between the ions. But again, this uh, works really only in. Uh, equilibrium real-time TDDFT would be maybe a possibility if uh, there would be a nice enough uh, generalization of the whole concept, right? Um, right now, it's just uh, choose your favorite kinetic equation from um, kinetic theory, right? Any, okay, so the symbols are Fokker, Planck, and Lasov, but this is usually a bit um, useless for warm dense matter, so you at least start at the quantum version of the uh, Boltzmann equation. And a Bolesco equation, or you know, if you would like to be suicidal, any kind of cardano fame equation, and either solve them directly or um, derive some moments and derive any kind of two temperature system or two temperature model where only where you have already introduced uh, temperature, or as we've done for aluminium, you know, give every iron mode or every phonon mode a different temperature and have a multi temperature system, and uh, there's no limit to the craziness in this direction. Right, you can have different spin temperatures if you like, uh, and stuff like this. Uh, yeah, so this is usually right now uh, the way to go. There's no real 
solid evidence there because uh, if I ask some experimentalists always if how far are we away from equilibrium, how near we are they are getting sometimes a bit hand wavy arguments. Right. Because uh, in order to be sure, we would have to measure the uh, electron distribution function, which in, in theory XRTS or XRD can do for high enough uh, wave numbers, right? And you get just a Doppler uh, broadening. So if you were in an equilibrium, the Doppler broadening would tell you something about the temperature. And if the shift is uh, off and you can't fill it with the temperature, then obviously you are not equilibrium. And then you would have to extract really, and theoretically you can, if the data is good enough, you can extract the uh, distribution function, you know, some, some non-equilibrium Fermi type, Maxwell type distribution function. Okay, but uh, you need good enough data for us. Right. I would have a follow-up question, and that is also maybe directed partly to Attila. So what's the current state of non-equilibrium weak functions for all matter? Because I recall that Andrew also at some point was interested in using those. Yeah, so this um, is not a developed field. So I have also my own interest in, uh, in this. So but what Jan actually said, so um, I think a, a good one approach could be time-dependent EFT generalized to take into account, um, not constrained to a closed quantum system, but time-dependent TFT to an open quantum system. And that's one way to basically allow non-equilibrium distribution of the electrons. But the Sandia people are also not following through with the kind of line. Uh, no, so, so Andrew Lubachewski, he had ideas on this, but as far as I know, at Sandia no one is currently looking at this. Right. Um, question to Jan, has there ever been a kind of fame calculation for the form of matter stuff? I mean, there's this one 2001 two paper from Michael. Yeah, I mean, the, the furthest uh, people have done with these kind of kinetic equations Michael Onitz in, in Kiel, right? And uh, so they uh, really think it works very well for some kind of low dimensional or artificial system. You know, like you can do it for Hubbard uh, chain, Ising model, whatever. But for 3D uh, warm dense matter, you know, with not just electrons in it, but also ions or you know, atoms or whatever. Uh, no. And even if it's only electrons, nobody has gone beyond this 2000. I know, and there's this one famous one where they have this linear crystallization of electrons. Right? It's a finite system of, I don't know, 20 electrons or something. Okay. Uh, what exactly is the bottleneck? Is the number of basis functions you need for temperature or? And yeah, and uh, so, I mean, it's a coupled system of equations that has to, you know, do the collisions and the screening and the non-equilibrium all at the same time. And as uh, soon as, you know, your interaction potential is technically Coulomb and you need to screen it and then snowballs from one equation that you have to solve into, I don't know, two or three. Okay. And then, yeah, yes, huge basis set because especially free electrons uh, from plane waves and you need lots of them. And then if you have uh, some kind of high energy tail and you need to sample this and you have the states over there. I mean, I'm now asking a naive question as an experimentalist. Um, you can probably write down the Hamiltonian of your system. Exactly. Sure, yes. yes. Yeah. Uh, wouldn't it make sense to think about completely different approximations than the ones that are now mainstream like DFT and so forth? for these types of problems. I mean, to make a completely fresh approach. Um, sure, I guess. It, um, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard, hard to see, right? We know, our, as you said, we know our potential. And um, we can write this in second quantization or whatever. I mean, like something like, uh, what's it called? Density matrix uh, renormalization yeah. or dynamic mean field. Stuff like this has never been tried. Uh, for this, um, wouldn't know how uh, how good this works for stuff like this. If I may add something, so one approach is um, it's not very far away, but it's still far away from DFT. It's density matrix functional theory, yeah. where it's it has some it is conceptually a little more difficult than DFT, yeah. but you can make controlled approximations to exchange a correlation. It's something that hasn't really been, there are some ideas there and with some initial approaches, but it's not a standard method like DFT. But what you can do is you can have, you can combine 
uh, many body perturbation theory easier with um, the C matrix function theory. So in that sense, you could derive those exchange correlation approximations or include finite temperature effects. Yeah, that's right. It's, What's a John Rare, Kash, uh, University of Washington or something? They do some cumulant uh, Green's function approach where they claim it's very powerful as well. So, I mean, there are some exotic uh, varieties out there. Right? I mean, after all, I mean, at some point, if something works in principle, there's always something different than if you can actually use it in, in, for practical application. Right? I mean, this is basically the big success of the last 20 years that, you know, we had some theory and we had some experiments, but we could never make, you know, like agree on a parameter range where both would actually, you know, give something sensible, which is now the case, right? Where for like the last 15 years or something, we can actually really calculate stuff, which is not totally, you know, outrageously wrong uh, for parameter regimes that uh, experimentalists can access. Mm -hmm. and, and so this has basically, you know, allowed us to do what I've shown today. Mm -hmm. right. I mean, another suicidal alternative would be time-dependent quantum Monte Carlo. So, in principle, it's possible it's just that you get the dynamic design problem on top of it. I mean, so there are, there are actually some results for, I don't know, maybe quantum dot system or so, but you have enough computational firepower. I assume the, the, the methods you use uh, are due to the fact that your calculational capability is limited. Computers have oh, yes. a finite size, basically. Uh, and uh, I mean, computers get bigger. Yes, yes part, that's part of the truth, right? right. The other truth, is like for instance, in DFT, I mean, there's uh, quite expensive exchange correlation functionals that are supposed to be better. But then again, that's all uh, very much trial and error. Um, mm -hmm. You know, some of the stuff that I've shown you here, uh, where there's supposedly better agreement with the experiment, uh, if one actually you know, thinks about it logically, it should. And, and you know, there's, I'll say, those uh, functionals were built for totally different reasons and it can only be uh, coincidence or accident that they give something uh, if one actually like, looks at the energy scales or anything, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, you know, lots of work to do. Further questions? Oh, yeah, picture of the energy. <laughs> if you pump a couple of uh, mega ampères uh, into a tiny little volume. It's a it's a Cynthia lab. Yeah, it's Cynthia. And it's really only called that machine because uh, that's the Z axis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I understood how it actually works. Yeah. Oh yeah, uh, you know J cross B. Yeah. Oh okay. And then, uh, this flyer, you know, that that's the target here, and then this this bit here so smashes into it. Uh, okay. Well, you know, makes for a nice picture. Okay. Well, no further questions, then thank you again uh, for a very.